So we're live right now. So I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thanks for joining us. And welcome to our Invest in a Better Tomorrow webinar. My name is Dan Gertz. I'm a financial advisor with Liberal Credit Union uh, in our Watford branch. Um, be getting into it uh, quite shortly here. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, there will be a question and answer period at the end. So feel free to submit any questions in the chat and we'll try to respond or, or we will reach out and respond in the coming days if we're not able to provide an immediate response. Um, just as a, uh, a thing I like to get doing, so by a show of hands, who's all attending this webinar? As AC Value and learning about responsible investments with two very well respected individuals in the responsible investment space. I can't actually see you, but uh, I wanted to make sure we have a, a little bit of fun with it as well too. So. Um, third thing that we quite often do when we have uh, um, group meetings or webinars, um, our speakers are very effective, knowledgeable, and quite good at capturing an audience. But with that being said, please, please, please know your fire exits. So that's always important uh, as well too. So, so if we can, uh, the first slide here at uh, Libra, we're focused on growing prosperity in Southwestern Ontario, uh, investing our profits back into the people, businesses, and communities we serve. Um, so currently across southwestern Ontario, Libro has 34 locations. We currently service over 107,000 owners uh, and Libro actively employs over 700 people. Next slide please. Libro is proud to be a certified B Corporation uh, joining leaders of the global movement of people using business as a force for good. Certified B Corporations or B Corps meet higher standards of social and environmental performance, transparency and accountability. Libro is proud to be a member of this community comprised of 2,600 B corporations from 150 industries operating in over 60 countries worldwide. Other notable companies that are B Corps include uh, Ben & Jerry's, uh, Danone, Patagonia and many, many more. So we encourage you to check out the B Corp website uh, and find some local B Corps near you as well too. What this all means is we have a purpose beyond profit, thinking differently about how we conduct our business and making decisions that have a positive impact on our owners, our communities and our staff. As well, Libro, Libro is a proud member of the Canadian Credit Union Association. Uh, Libro made the platinum list on Aon's best list for 2019 uh, as a best employer and was named one of best places to work by London Incorporated Magazine in 2019. So purpose is a way of doing business. Instead of doing good things, once we've earned profit, we earn profit by doing good things. It's an approach that goes beyond earning a profit. And it means we consider a triple bottom line, people, planet and profit, when making decisions and building strategy. And uh, next slide, please. So one of the ways Libro does this is through working closely with our owners to help them achieve prosperity. Owners entrust their money with us, and we use those funds to invest in people, businesses, and organizations within Southwestern Ontario. By doing that, Libro is creating stronger communities, job opportunities, and care for the environment. In turn, our investments generate profit. We share our profits with the community through grants, sponsorships, and partnerships. Through all this, Libro owners receive competitive returns, the best coaching and services, and share of our profits. Next slide, please. Uh, on the heels of this as well too, Libra has a special offer. Um, start investing in mutual funds with a new pre-authorized contribution and Libra will make the first deposit for you up to $50. So talk to a Libra coach. If you have an opportunity to reach out to your coach, wonderful. If not, leave us a message and we'll have your coach uh, reach out to you in the coming days as well too to see if mutual funds can be the right investment option for you. So first up, we've got uh, our speaker. Um, it uh, is Dustin Lance. Uh, just as a brief introduction, Dustin Lance is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Responsible Investment Association. And that's a Canadian organization that promotes the incorporation of environmental, social and governance. And we'll refer to that as ESG factors into investment decisions. Dustin is regularly quoted in the national media as an expert on responsible investing by CBC News, the Globe and Mail, BNN Bloomberg, and other Canadian media outlets. 
Dustin is also a columnist for Investment Executive and a contributor to the Globe and Mail, where he writes about topics related to responsible investment and sustainable finance. He is a frequent public speaker at some of Canada's leading investment conferences and business schools, and he is a member of Canada's 30% Club, a network of executives that aims to achieve a gender balance in corporate leadership. In 2014, Dustin helped to launch Canada's first financial designations for financial advisors with expertise in responsible investing. In 2016, he received a Clean 50 Emerging Leader Award for his contributions to sustainable development in Canada. And in 2018, he was appointed to Wealth Professional Magazine's hot list of 50 influencers in Canada's investment industry. Prior to joining the Responsible Investment Association in 2013, Dustin worked for the Centre for International Governance Innovation, where he conducted research to strengthen the governance of the global financial system. His written work has been published by leading think tanks and academic journals in Canada and internationally. He holds a bachelor's degree from York University and a master's degree from the University of Waterloo. Dustin, welcome. Thank you so much for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you so much to Libro Credit Union for, for hosting this important event and for uh, having uh, giving me the opportunity to, to speak with your, uh, your audience. Um, I'm going to now share my slides, so bear with me just a moment while I pull that up. Uh, okay. All right, so um, before we get started, actually, um, I just wanted to do a couple of acknowledgements. Um, you know, although this event is uh, a it's a virtual event in a virtual space, um, you know, we're all in our, our homes somewhere. I'm uh, at my home uh, in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Haudenosaunee peoples who were the rightful caretakers uh, of this land long before my ancestors got here. So I want to acknowledge that. And also, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, given the events of this year, uh, we at our organization have been doing a lot of learning about allyship and, and unconscious bias. And I also want to then take a, mo a moment to acknowledge uh, that I'm privileged to have many unearned advantages that have enabled me to be in this position, um, talking with you about responsible investing, something I'm so deeply passionate about. So um, I really wanted to make those acknowledgements uh, before we dive in. Um, and, you know, in the investment industry, we, we do have a, a bad habit of, of using lots of numbers and charts, uh, and I will certainly use some numbers and charts, but I want to start with a few photographs um, to help tell the story of, of why it is we do what we do and, and why I think it's so important. So this will be a, an image that will be very familiar to us. Um, in 2019, uh, students took to the streets and around the world. This is a photograph taken of students in Montreal uh, protesting uh, to get uh, grown-ups like us to, to take action on, on climate change. You know, if we want to avoid the worst impacts of, of climate change, we need to keep the planet to within 1.5 degrees Celsius of, of warming over the pre-industrial period or at the very worst, two degrees Celsius as an upper limit. Uh, unfortunately, we're already at the one degree uh, at the one degree uh, at the one degree threshold, and current policies have us on track to get closer to four degrees Celsius. Uh, and young people, of course, are not too happy about about that, nor should they be, uh, because we're talking about uh, more devastating droughts and wildfires like we're seeing uh, on the west coast right now more extreme weather events like uh, the hurricanes we're seeing in the gulf of mexico right now sea level rise forced migration ecosystem collapse um, just to name a few of the issues associated with climate change and make no mistake uh, these issues um, will come with economic disruptions and financial risks uh, so this is a really important thing to consider for for investors this is a terribly tragic photo taken in 2013. It's a photograph of the Savar uh, textile factory in, in Bangladesh, excuse me, the Rana Plaza uh, factory in, in Bangladesh. And, and on April, I believe it was April 24th, 2013, in the middle of the workday, there was no 
there was no earthquake. There was no seismic activity of any kind. The building literally just collapsed and took over 1,100 people's lives with it. It's a disturbing photo. It's a sad photo. Um, but the reason I, I put it in here as a reminder, uh, as a reminder of why we do responsible investing, the saddest thing, I mean, it's, it's such a uh, tragic uh, image, but what makes it you know, even worse is that this was a totally preventable event. Um, the, the companies in, were not uh, doing a good job of, of making sure that their workers were in safe working conditions in, in buildings that were uh, you know, well-functioning and, and meeting code. And this serves as a reminder of why we need to be aware of the companies in our portfolio and why those companies in our portfolios need to be making sure uh, that they have, uh, you know, safety protocols and they're looking after workers and their supply chains. This is a photograph of a board of directors of a, a large Fortune 500 company. Um, if this were a live event, I would ask you know, the audience, what's wrong with this photo? And I think in 2020, uh, we all know what's wrong with this photo. Um, there's clearly a lack of representation uh, of both women and, and people of color. Um, and the sad reality is that far too many boards uh, and senior management teams of, of large companies look quite a lot like this. Um, in Canada, women hold, uh, depending on which index you look at, um, within all companies that are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, women hold only 19% uh, of those board seats, despite making up half the population. And uh, people of color hold just uh, roughly 5% of the board seats uh, among publicly traded companies in, in, in Canada. So um, this is, uh, again, an unfortunate photo, but it's a reminder um, that we have work to do as a society. And the good thing about responsible investing is that it does give us an opportunity to put our money to work uh, to work towards a better society. So I have three objectives for my opening presentation. I want to answer three questions. Number one, what is responsible investing? Number two, how does it work? And then number three, why does it matter? And, uh, and then I'd be happy to take uh, questions afterwards or drill down into specific issues, but I think that will set up uh, David quite light nicely uh, to carry on with his, with his presentation. So first off, what do we mean when we talk about responsible investing? Uh, we're talking about investments that incorporate or that consider environmental, social, and corporate governance issues. Uh, there's a list of each of these issues or some examples of ESG issues up there. You may hear in the news or on BNN, this term ESG gets thrown around a lot. It refers to environment, social, and, and governance issues. And that's what responsible investing is all about. It's all about incorporating these issues into investment decisions and investment management. Um, and uh, you could see that some of the environmental issues will be things like pollution, water and waste management, uh, sustainable packaging. For example, uh, you know, single-use plastics have really been in the spotlight over the last year or so. These are some of the issues that can be not just uh, issues from, say, a personal values perspective, but they can also be what investors would say are material issues. They uh, very much could have financial implications, uh, which is why it makes responsible investing so important, not just from a personal values perspective, but also from a purely, what we would say, valuation perspective or a purely financial perspective. Um, in terms of social issues, human capital management, such a huge issue. Another way would, to say this would be talent management, uh, are you treating your people well? Are you treating your workers well? Are the companies, are they diverse? Are they protecting human rights in the supply chains? The photo I showed in the introduction shows what can happen if companies are not looking after uh, the social aspects, not looking after people in their, in their supply chains. And then corporate governance is a little bit more obscure, um, but some examples of corporate governance issues would be CEO pay executive compensation, how much is the CEO getting paid compared to the average worker within the organization? Uh, is the company ha um, look, looking, uh, taking steps to protect the data of its customers? So this is called cybersecurity or data security. Um, who's on the board of directors? 
Does it represent society? Does it represent the clientele that uh, the companies are aiming to serve? These are some of examples of environmental, social, and corporate governance issues. And again, that's what responsible vesting is all about. It's about considering these issues. This slide shows um, uh, a, a very brief evolution of responsible investing, where it started and where we are now or where we're headed. Um, responsible investing really has its roots in modern day responsible investing. It has its roots in uh, the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, you will be familiar, many of you will be familiar with apartheid in, in South Africa. This was a systematically racist form of government that granted uh, uh, basically subordinated people of color uh, in that country. And so this was a long-standing uh, government in South Africa. And over time, the international community just became less and less tolerant uh, of this sy truly systemic racism in South Africa. So um, international investors, including uh, many in Canada, some of the first um, uh, responsible investors in Canada were churches and faith groups. Uh, lobbying the federal government of Canada to boycott uh, trade with South Africa. And, and, um, and there was also an effort to, to pressure financial institutions to divest from South Africa, to, to stop providing any financing, uh, whether it's debt or equity or any capital of, uh, of any sort, to companies doing business in South Africa in order to put pressure on, on the government to change. And this was actually, uh, so nowadays you'll hear a little bit about uh, divestment from coal or, or other fossil fuels as, as being one type of uh, campaign that you might hear about, but this would be the first major divestment campaign. And uh, it was quite successful, uh, and I wouldn't attribute the end of apartheid solely to, to investment, but um, what we did see in South Africa is uh, South African companies, they lost access to global capital markets. Um, and because of that, South African companies flipped. They started pressuring their own government to, to end apartheid. So that's, that's, um, that's really where, where modern day responsible investing has its roots. Um, and so, uh, but I wanna be clear, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, that divestment or boycotting uh, or excluding companies is one approach to responsible investing among many. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, my organization, the Responsible Investment Association, we're a nonprofit organization with a mandate to promote responsible investing in Canada. We were founded as the SIO in 1990, 30 years ago as the Social Investment Organization. We have since uh, rebranded, but we still have the same mandate to promote responsible investing in Canada, uh, both Libro and NEI Investments and, and their parent company, Aviso Wealth, are all members of our association. Uh, so, so the activity in, in Canada around responsible investing uh, has really uh, been going for uh, roughly 30 years. Uh, fast forward to the mid 2000s, you see that PRI logo that stands for the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Uh, and so in 2006, the United Nations collaborated with, with industry to develop these six principles for responsible investment. And so these principles uh, would be uh, signed on to by institutional investors like NEI investments or pension funds uh, and foundations would often be signatories to these principles. And then what the signatories do is they, they basically pledge to implement these six principles to incorporate, for example, environmental and social issues to act as stewards of capital and engage with companies in their portfolio to improve social environmental outcomes. So that was a, a really, I think, important point in the history of responsible investing worldwide. I don't want to get too caught up in the jargon uh, of some of these other frameworks, but I think a few things that you'll be familiar with here are the rainbow, um, the, the rainbow logo there you may be familiar with. That's the Sustainable Development Goals were launched in 2015 by the UN again uh, to act as sort of a blueprint for uh, sustainable development as a roadmap for the world to improve. Uh, on social and environmental issues. And then also in the same year in 2015, we saw the Paris Agreement, uh, which is uh, was agreed upon by roughly 190 countries around the world, uh, agreeing to limit their, um, their greenhouse gas emissions to be aligned with a two degree, uh, two degree Celsius uh, scenario for global warming with a stretch target of meeting that 1.5 degrees Celsius target that I mentioned. Um, and so there's some other acronyms there we don't need to get too far into, but what I really wanted to show here was that responsible investing 
uh, has its roots uh, going back to the late 70s, early 80s. But in the mid 2010s, around 2015, 2016, we've started to see real uptake, a real tipping point towards responsible investing, uh, no longer just being a um, on the fringes, but actually just becoming best practice in terms of investment management. So that's sort of a short history of responsible investing there. So now that we've you know, defined responsible investing and talked a little bit about what it is, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how it works in practice. Um, so as I mentioned, responsible investment is all about incorporating ESG issues or factoring in, considering ESG issues. But there's a number of different ways that an investment manager can do that. Uh, and I'll give a brief overview of these, basically five of the core strategies that uh, an investment institution might take for, for incorporating ESG issues. One uh, is called ESG integration. So um, this would be uh, where the investment manager is, is combining, say, ESG analysis or sustainability analysis. They're looking at environmental, social, and governance issues, and they're incorporating, they're basically doing analysis on those issues the sa same way that they would uh, do financial analysis, and they might even merge uh, ESG analysis with financial analysis. And I won't get too uh, technical there, but it's a way of uh, basically using data and integrating that data into uh, investment decisions alongside financial data. And so that's that's one way that responsible investment can be made in practice. Um, on the left, you'll see the bubble that says shareholder engagement. This is one of the most prominent responsible investment strategies in Canada. It's a strategy that uh, NEI Investments is, is very well known for. Um, so this refers to the use of shareholder power to engage with companies to improve their environmental and social performance. Um, and this sort of starts from the, the recognition that no company is really perfect. Um, so we're gonna take a stake in companies and encourage them to uh, improve. For example, um, uh, you know, one example, again, to use NEI as an example, in 2016, uh, NEI Investments engaged with one of the largest oil companies in Canada called Suncor. Um, and they wanted to know how Suncor planned to operate in the future of a, of a low carbon world. And so they asked Suncor, will you, you know, they asked Suncor to disclose how they plan to operate in a low carbon world. And to the surprise of, of many in the responsible investment community at the time, uh, Suncor agreed. They said, yeah, we think it's important to, to disclose that information. And since then they've been publishing, I'm not sure if it's annual, but just about annual reports on how they do plan to transition and adapt and position themselves to succeed over the long term in a carbon constrained world. So that's one example of how shareholder engagement can be a really powerful tool for change. Um, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a bubble that says negative and positive screening. Um, so negative screening, another, this is, forgive the jargon, um, another word for this would just be divestment or avoiding or boycotting uh, certain companies. So th this would be similar to the example that I gave in the in the last slide about uh, South Africa, about um, uh, about the divestment campaign to South Africa. So that's uh, known as uh, negative screening. Um, more commonly today, how you'll see negative screening put into practice uh, would be excluding certain industries from a portfolio. Uh, for example, such as tobacco or weapons. These are very common uh, negative screens or exclusions from responsible investments. Um, and then positive screening with the, with the plus sign uh, there, that's just uh, signaling that there is such thing as positive screening, also known as uh, best in class. Uh, and the idea there being to uh, choose investments, choose companies that perform very well, that have positive performance on environmental, social and corporate governance issues. Uh, so those are three very common strategies. On the bottom two bubbles, you'll see impact investing and thematic ESG investing. So impact investing refers to uh, an approach where there'd be a dual mandate uh, for the investment to, uh, to deliver a financial return alongside uh, measurable uh, social or environmental returns. So generating uh, measurable positive social or environmental impacts. An example would be 
uh, investing in a clean tech company or renewable energy company, uh, or for example, um, in a fund that is say providing uh, micro loans to um, to um, uh, traditionally underserved communities. Uh, these would be examples of of impact investments. And then thematic ESG. So this refers to uh, choosing a theme to invest in. Uh, and again, I, I know NEI is here, so I'll keep using uh, keep using NEI's examples. They have a, a NEI's Environmental Leaders Fund. Uh, so this would be the theme there would be environmental leaders and that would be an example of a thematic esg fund there are others as well such as women in leadership and and other themes uh, that uh, a responsible investment manager might follow but i thought it was really important and for, forgive me if i'm going too fast or if i'm being a little bit technical i just thought it was really important to communicate to the audience that there's there's no one size fits all to responsible investment there are a number of different approaches and it's really up to you and your advisor to, to figure out which approaches are, are best for you. Um, a little bit now about the market in Canada. Uh, forgive me for the data being a couple years old here. We have a new report coming out in about a month that will have updated numbers, but you can see the trend is clearly, uh, as they often say, hockey stick like growth. Um, the market for responsible investment in Canada, uh, last we measured it um, at the end of 2017, was at stood, was stood at 2.1 trillion in assets. Uh, to put that in context, that was about half of all Canadian professionally managed assets in the country. And the reason that number is so high is because there's a lot of really big institutions in there like pension funds, university endowments, uh, and, and so forth, and big mutual fund companies uh, as well. Um, and then you can see the growth really over you know four years there the market doubling for between 2013 and 2017 so lots of growth happening in the market for responsible investment um, that was all in canada this slide this next slide uh, i won't stay on it too long but remember i mentioned this united nations principles for responsible investment uh, the blue bar chart shows the uh, assets under management uh, so the total assets that are um, being managed by all of the different institutional investors who've signed on to these principles. So as you can see from 2006, uh, it was something like, uh, some, looks like it was maybe five trillion, uh, whereas today it's sitting close to to a hundred trillion in assets under management. And the orange line shows the sheer number of signatories. So I think the key takeaway he here is again, tons of growth happening in responsible investment, not just in Canada, but around the world. So now we've talked a little bit about what is responsible investing um, and how it works. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about why it matters to you as, as an investor. So we do, um, I, I mentioned we do uh, a, a research report called the Canadian uh, Responsible Investment Trends Report. We have a new one coming out uh, in about a month. And so in the last report, a couple of years ago, we asked uh, institutional investors, so these are the largest, most sophisticated uh, investors in the country. Uh, we asked them, why do you consider environmental, social, and governance factors in your investment decisions? And the top five responses are all up there on the screen. As you can see, the top response from these large, sophisticated investors was to minimize risk over time. Uh, the second uh, most common response was to improve returns over time, which makes sense because if you reduce your risk over time, uh, the thesis would be that you'll see better returns over time. And the third top response was to meet demand. Investors are interested in, in responsible investing. Uh, beneficiaries being those uh, beneficiaries to say a pension plan policy, uh, expressing their interest in responsible investing. Uh, so that being the third most common response. And then the fourth response is to fulfill fiduciary duty. So this is an idea of uh, where trustees uh, would have an obligation to act in the best interest of their clients. That's a fiduciary relationship, kind of like I have as a CEO of the Responsible Investment Association. I have a fiduciary relationship to our members who, who provide membership fees. Uh, and so I'm a steward of those assets. I have to act uh, with great care when making decisions. So that's uh, the fourth top response. Uh, basically, investors saying they want to act in the best interest of, of their clients with great care. And the fifth uh, top reason was to fulfill uh, personal values, to fulfill uh, an organization's mission or values. And so 
uh, I think it's important to to really see these top five responses as a full package. Um, there's basically a strong business case for incorporating, uh, for, for doing responsible investment. And also, uh, you can align your investments with your values. Uh, and these are the reasons that some of the, as I mentioned, the largest, most sophisticated investors in the countries are doing responsible investment. Uh, this is a, a, a statistic from the RIA Investor Opinion Survey, which is a survey we do of Canadian retail investors. So these are individual investors just like you and I, um, as opposed to the big institutions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so just the, by the very fact of you being here in the audience listening to this presentation, watching this presentation, um, I'm kind of letting you know that you're in the majority of people who really want to be informed about responsible investment. In our survey, 82% of investors somewhat strong, somewhat or strongly agreed that they would like their financial advisor uh, to inform them about responsible investments that are aligned with their values. Um, and again, if we had you know, um, a physical space, I'd ask for a show of hands and, and try to have an engaging discussion about this. Um, but I think the key message here is, uh, most Canadians are interested in responsible investment. They want to talk about it with their advisor. And if you want to talk about it with, you, with your advisor, you're in the right place. Um, so what about performance? This is always a big question. And I, I'm, forgive me, there's a few you know, num numerical type graphs in here. Uh, but I do think it's, uh, it's important to, to show that responsible investments can perform just as well, if not better than traditional investments. What you're looking at here is an index uh, of, of uh, called the MSCI World ESG Leaders Index. So MSCI is just a company that, that, that makes it, um, but what the World ESG Leaders means is they basically, um, they've made a, a package, uh, a bundle of companies, and, and they've uh, chosen this bundle of companies based on them having uh, leading ESG scores. So these are companies um, that would be considered more sustainable and more responsible by the data provider. And so the blue line shows that World ESG Leaders Index compared to um, the yellow line, which is just all companies within the World Index there. And you can see there's a slight outperformance over time. The blue line is slightly higher than the yellow line since the inception of this index in 2007. So this just goes to show that if you had, say, been invested in this index since 2007, you would actually have made slightly more money than if you had been investing just in the broader market. So this is a similar index, but just for the Canadian context, for the Canadian market. Uh, so MSCI, again, just a company um, that makes this index, and, but focus on the Canada ESG leaders part. And so this is a index or a basket of companies um, that have high ESG scores or high sustainability scores. And that's the yellow line reflecting those companies that have high ESG scores. And as you can see, um, it does kind of track alongside the yellow line, which is the broader market, but there's quite a big difference between that blue line and that yellow line, um, meaning that the, the ESG leaders in Canada have qu quite strongly outperformed the broader market in this index since inception. And this is the last uh, slide where I'll, I'll, I'll provide numbers and charts. Um, I wanted to give a, a, you know, speak to the current moment. Um, this is the most recent, these are the most recent charts we have showing the average performance of responsible investment funds in Canada. So this is data from the second quarter of 2020. So that would be uh, from April through the end of June. So that's when the pandemic was was really hitting full swing. Um, on these charts, you can see the uh, the blue bars show the average performance of responsible investment funds in that category, and the yellow bars just show the average performance uh, of all funds in that category. So as you can see, um, in both the Canadian equity, so that's the Canadian stock market, and the global equity, that's the global stock market. The blue lines are higher than the yellow, the blue bars are higher than the yellow bars across the board. Meaning if you look at the five year, for example, the five year returns on, on both charts, you can see responsible investments. The average of responsible investments has outperformed the average of the broader market. And even if you look in at the that one um, on the Canadian equity chart where there's the one year performance, you can see um, 
the market was down uh, over that period. But notice that the blue bar is down less than the yellow bar. So that means that uh, the average uh, returns of Canadian responsible investment funds and the, and the Canadian equity class, they actually lost less money um, than, than uh, the broader Canadian market in that period. So this, uh, this chart, I think, or this slide can just, uh, you know, provide a little bit more, uh, I think, clarity what, you know, that then those indexes showed that responsible investment funds really can uh, outperform. And I want to just put out a disclaimer that this doesn't necessarily mean that every single responsible investment fund will outperform every single time. But on average, over the long term, the research shows that's actually the case. And I just want to close off with a couple of real world examples that you may be familiar with um, so you can get a sense of how ESG, uh, you know, really comes into play for companies and for shareholders. So uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil rig explosion that happened in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this was a tragic, again, loss of life. I think it was about 11, uh, 11 of the, the crew uh, lost their life and, and, and also an environmental and ecological catastrophe um, that uh, completely destroyed the ecosystem uh, of, of, of many animals and wildlife living in, in the Gulf. And so, so that explosion happened in April of 2010. And you can see the arrow on the chart that shows uh, when the Deepwater Horizon exploded. This, by the way, is the share price. This chart shows the price of the shares, the value of the shares. And you can see uh, over the what, April, May, June, over the two months that it took them to plug that hole in the bottom of the Gulf, the shares of BP had dropped by 55% over that time horizon. So um, this just goes to show that not only was uh, this a massive uh, environmental catastrophe, a human loss of life, but also a huge loss for investors who were exposed to this company. Um, and there were a couple of uh, ESG research firms who actually had downgraded BP shortly before um, this uh, this incident. So, um, and and you might you might wonder so. You know, nobody has a crystal ball dust, and how could you possibly see this coming as an investor? So, one way uh, to, in this case, one way that investors did have uh, a chance to see it coming was by looking at the health and safety record of BP in the three years leading up to this incident. Um, in the three years leading up to this explosion, BP had been cited for 760 willful and egregious health and safety violations by the regulator in the US, 760. To put that into context, the next highest number among oil companies, among energy companies, I think it was eight. It was single digits. It was eight, I believe it was ConocoPhillips. So 760 willful, egregious safety violations versus eight. There were red flags there, but they just weren't in the financial statements. They weren't in the financial metrics alone. You had to look more holistically at the company uh, and look at more qualitative factors like the health and safety performance of the company. And using ESG uh, or responsible investment can give you a lens to do that. So that's one concrete example. I'll close off with, with one other that's more recent. Uh, many of you will remember in 2015, Volkswagen uh, was found to have uh, been systematically uh, rigging their uh, vehicles with this uh, this device, this defeat device um, that would basically fake the greenhouse gas emissions produced by the vehicle. Um, and so when the car hit the road, it would start polluting and, and putting out lots of emissions. But when it would go, basically the car would know, so to speak, the car would know when it's getting tested for emissions. And then it would, and then it would, it would reduce its emissions. Uh, so it really was very much a scandal that kind of crossed lines between gov corporate governance failure as well as an environmental issue. And as you can see, after that became public, Volkswagen's shares had dropped by 35% in less than a week. So this just goes to show again that um, uh, you know some of these issues, these environmental, the social issues, the corporate governance issues can quickly become 
uh, financial issues. In the case of both BP and Volkswagen, you have uh, some examples. So, so I think I'll pause there um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, please feel free to type questions in the box if there is one. Um, and I'll be happy to stick around and, and hear from David's presentation and happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dustin. That's fantastic. Uh, a lot of uh, great information therein. A uh, little, uh, little bit more about Libra on that uh, space as well, too, and how this, uh, how this correlates with Libra's values. Libra has recently uh, taken on a lean mindset, so a bit of reflection after everybody speaks. I'm just going to make a, a couple comments on things that really resonated with me. Um, the real uptick uh, in the RI space right now with our strategies, you know, the shareholder engagement, the ESG integration, positive negative screening, thematic ESG and impact investing. Um, those really resonated with me. Um, the data supply, supply as well too, $2.1 trillion in assets and that's uh, entering into pension funds and the growth <laughs> happening in this space. Uh, and the data supported by it's pretty fantastic. Uh, and especially the no one size fits all and the best approach is tailored to everyone specifically. There is value to me with what it looks like for each and everyone's personal investing objectives and, and how they can align with your, uh, how to align your investment. Next up, we've got uh, David Rutherford. Uh, David Rutherford is a vice president of uh, ESG services at NEI, that's Northwest Ethical Investments. He originally joined NEI as Vice President of Marketing in August 2016 with a mandate to lead the repositioning of the organization around responsible investing. In his current role since May 2019, David is leading NEI's ESG team and program helping reinforce the company's leadership position in the rapidly changing investment landscape and increasingly competitive responsible investment space. A highly versatile leader with 30 plus years experience in corporate government, agency and nonprofit organization. David holds an undergraduate degree in urban and regional planning from Ryerson University and earned a master's degree in social, in social psychology from the London School of Economics, where he examined the impact of digital technology on human behavior and interaction. He also earned his living as an abstract oil painter, cartoonist, writer and journalist. So please welcome David Rutherford. Dan, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction and uh, really happy to be here. I had a chance to come down to London and speak to Liberal Advisors uh, last year. Obviously, I'm not going to get that chance to do that this year, but um, I'm very happy to do it this way. And let me also echo, echo Dustin's comments uh, around the land acknowledgement. I too am here in Toronto and also around the many privileges that I've been afforded uh, by virtue of who I am and what I look like. So uh, I really want, really happy to see Dustin offering uh, those kind of remarks. What I want to talk about today is, as the title says, why responsible investing is more important than ever, but not necessarily more important to us at any but more important to you as investors. And what I want to do is run through uh, very quickly uh, a little bit of research that I've done at the University of Toronto on what's really driving the demand for responsible investing among retail investors uh, like yourselves, like me, like Dustin, and also then get into some examples of the corporate engagement work Dustin talked about with shareholder engagement, get into some examples of that and show how the two connect. So uh, with that, I'll move on to the next slide if I could. So there's clearly something happening here. This is the third hockey stick we've seen today. Uh, and so this is uh, flows into US uh, based sustainable funds in, uh, during the past decade. And you, as you can see from 2010 to 2020, things kind of trucked along and then something happened in roughly 2019. And we've seen flows into US funds skyrocket. And we were having a similar pattern here in Canada as well. So what's happening here? If we could go to the next slide. Uh, we believe that everything happens for a reason and we think this might be the reason why it's happening. So Dustin talked about the uh, Deepwater Horizon explosion. There it is on there around 2010. He talked about the factory collapse in Bangladesh. There it is. He talked about Volkswagens uh, lying about their diesel emissions. There they are. We had all these kinds of incidents happening through the 2010s, uh, you know, sporadically. I could probably add, you know, quite a few more in there, but, you know, 
only a handful of them really got into the mind space of, uh, uh, of citizens through the news media. But when we entered into 2018 and then 2019 and now 20, uh, we've really had these big transformational uh, news items happening. The first you may not have noticed, but it was really important from a business perspective. And that is when Larry Fink, who you see pictured there, he, Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock Investments. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. And he put out a letter at the beginning of 2018 said, look, companies can't just be beholden to shareholders anymore. They must be beholden and their purpose must be related to driving value for all stakeholders. That is essentially uh, the thesis behind responsible investing. And it was a real stake in the ground uh, for companies to take notice of what was expected to the, of them from investors. Following that, we had massive wildfires in Australia, in the Amazon, in California. This is before the most recent ones that we had in California and in Oregon and Washington. And then that was followed by a 16 year old from Sweden, Greta Thunberg, basically driving people out to the streets to protest against inaction on climate change. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people in cities across the world uh, going on these climate strikes for climate change, all driven by one person. And then in the spring of 2020, uh, you know, late winter, early spring of 2020, we had COVID-19, which really, you know, uh, cracked open the the faults in our system and, and made it clear to us that uh, you know our economic system, our social systems weren't nearly as resilient as we might have thought they were. Uh, you know, causing us to rethink everything that we're doing. And then on top of that, we had the death of George Floyd, massive protests uh, on the streets of the U.S. and in Canada, uh, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. So you've got this massive social economic environmental shift happening at the same time that we're seeing this massive spike in responsible solutions and the sales of responsible solutions. And we happen to think the two are, are really uh, inexorably connected. So if we go to the next slide, you know, what's behind all this? Well, the first thing is people are confident they can make a difference with their own actions. So they are taking action uh, to, to make a difference in the world. Uh, whether it's donating or recycling or buying ethically. Almost everyone thinks they can be a part of that discussion. And the next slide is, you know, they think that responsible uh, investing is part of the solution. So yeah, we are in the next slide, that's good. Uh, responsible uh, investment is part of the solutions. Three out of four investors think RI or responsible investing is the wave of the future. 90% of the millennials want to invest responsibly to solve some of the issues you see there on the screen around plastic reduction, climate change, uh, you know, the sustainable development goals uh, that, that Dustin mentioned. They see a responsible investing as a way to get that done. If we go on to the uh, next slide, we know when uh, investors are surveyed that uh, performance is still a very important goal when they invest responsibly. And you saw Dustin pr provide the performance proof points. Uh, you know, people didn't always believe that, but I think the, the, uh, the, the, the myth of RI underperformance has been burst completely. And, and investors, as well as their advisors, are starting to realize that, yes, I can invest responsibly and that is going to drive returns. Similarly, on the next slide, we know that for investors who want to invest responsibly, making a difference is still a vital, vital concern. And we can see that continues to be at the core of why people invest responsibly. None of that has changed. But what we have seen is a subtle shift uh, tied, I believe, to a lot of the fundamental change that we're seeing in society and people's desire to take active responsibility to help make that change. And so if we go to the next slide, here we have some research um, uh, from Oxford Risk. So Oxford Risk is a, a behavioral finance uh, consultancy. And, and what they did is they surveyed investors and been in particular responsible investors. And, and they asked them about their attitudes towards you know, the, the, the responsible investment solutions that they chose. And, and what we found was it was really interesting that for those investors who were really driven by purpose, 
which I believe is what's what's driving the desire for change. People want to en help enable their purpose. For those investors, they think of making change first. They don't think of of you know making that positive difference. They don't think of performance. They think of how can I make change first. And so the real uh, piece of evidence with that was they found Oxford Risk did that people would prefer to actively engage with the management of unsustainable companies rather than invest in sustainable companies. And what that told us was that if you if you believe in the thesis of responsible investing, what that told us is that people are willing to forego short term performance to actually engage with companies and make a difference in how they operate. And so to us, that was a really fundamental uh, shift in thinking about what's driving the demand for responsible investing. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that if you look at this concept of purpose on a on a uh, spectrum, you can see it goes from purpose delegation to purpose enablement. On the at the delegation end of the spectrum, you have people who maybe buy from Patagonia or they buy from uh, you know Unilever, which is a a you know well known sustainable uh, leader. That's purpose led consumption, and it's uh, it, it is how increasingly all consumers are are buying their products, and it simply is saying to a company, look, I'll buy your product if you do this for me. So it's still transactional. It's you're still delegating that responsibility for change to that company, but you're using your dollars to help drive that delegation. As you move further up the, the spectrum, you, you get a purpose like consumer boycott. So that is if a company is doing a bad thing, I'm not going to support you. That's very similar to, to a negative screening that Dustin talked about, except it's in the consumer space. As you move further up the chain, there's volunteerism. So that's where you're stepping out your front door and you're actively trying to make a difference by volunteering your time or your money. The challenge with volunteerism is that uh, you know, volunteering primarily takes place at the local level. So if you want to uh, drive big global fundamental change, it's difficult to do on a volunteer basis. But if you move at the furthest end of it to the towards purpose enablement, you walk into the space occupied by responsible investing. And here you have an opportunity as an investor to help really enable the purpose that is becoming so important to you to you because of all the things that are going on in the world, all all the you know all the case for change that's being made by everything that's happening with this incredible uh, seismic shift in in attitudes, uh, but there's a there's a challenge with this, and that is it isn't just plain responsible investing that can help enable your purpose. You need to think about which approach you're undertaking because some approaches do it better than others. And so if you go to the next slide, this is a different looking version of the five circle slide that Dustin presented. And so what it shows is that as you move up the RI pyramid, the responsible investment pyramid, you find that each, uh, each approach to responsible investing requires a greater degree of commitment from the organization undertaking that. But as you move up that chain of commitment, you find that the potential to enable your purpose and uh, to enable your purpose increases. So if you're just simply screening out tobacco stocks, that is the same, as I said, as delegating your responsibility. But if you're trying to be really actively responsible for change in the world and you move up into the engagement space, then you find this incredible connection uh, between what an organization might be doing uh, and how that organization is representing you at the table with the companies that you invest in. And that's what I want to spend the rest of my uh, presentation talking about is giving you some examples of the work that we do at NEI uh, with some of the companies that we own and how we are trying to drive change and give our investors a voice at the table with the companies we own and the companies they own. So if we go to the next slide is the title slide. We're going to go through some case studies. So the first one is around big tech. And so everybody knows that in this post COVID world, we're all online all the time and big company, big tech companies have done extremely well uh, during this time from a financial perspective. Uh, I think everybody has read 
uh, how many multiples Jeff Bezos' uh, salary and, and compensation has increased uh, during this time. I don't think we need to hear that again. But what we're finding with some of these big tech companies is that there are significant issues around the protection of your data, around the protection of your identity, around the protection of your digital rights, in addition to some of the content that's that's placed on the platforms uh, of some of these uh, these companies, which can be beyond offensive but outright dangerous. And and so what we did is we we were entered a collaborative engagement with a group of investors, and it was about 80 different investors representing $10 trillion. And we went to Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. And we said, look, we're really concerned about human rights risks on uh, in your business model. And we think it would be a good idea for you to add a human rights oversight committee on your board. And so we wrote them a letter and, and asked if they would consider that. Uh, they politely uh, declined our advances, which often happens in the early parts of a of a corporate engagement. So we uh, we waited until the annual general meeting uh, this past June, and we put a shareholder resolution on the on the table saying, you know, we're asking for the board uh, to create a human rights oversight committee. Uh, we didn't win. We knew we wouldn't win because the majority of shares are held by the two founders, and there's a dual share uh, structure that makes it very difficult to drive change through through uh, uh, through this means. But what we did here in the first, I'd say, 10 to 15 minutes of the chairman of the board's remarks in, in opening the AGM was he was talking all about human rights. So clearly they had gotten the message. So just because, you know, we didn't get the votes and just because they didn't answer us doesn't mean they didn't hear us. And so that's the key with some of these engagements is to really get your voice in the ear of management, get your voice in the ear uh, uh, of the board and try and drive change that way. So that that's an example of, and this this engagement is ongoing. We're going to continue to work uh, uh, with Alphabet and with Facebook uh, to try and advance these issues. And when I say with, I, I mean it. These are not confrontational engagements. These are very collaborative engagements where we are trying to, you know, really point out to the these companies some of the business risks they may not see themselves and helping them understand that if they address these risks, they will be uh, more viable, uh, uh, more sustainable and more successful companies as a result. So if we can go to the next slide. So uh, also a big industry right now are pharma companies. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to create a vaccine. Everybody's trying to create new COVID treatments. We've already made tremendous advances. So uh, we engaged with with a handful of pharma companies, and you know we asked them to really consider six key principles uh, in in their operations. One was around ensuring employee health and safety. Uh, pharma employees are working uh, sometimes with very dangerous viruses. We want to make sure they are well protected first and foremost. The second is we want to make sure that when a vaccine comes out, that it is. Uh, available to the people who need it most. In other words, we're asking these companies to distribute it on a needs-based basis. We're also asking these companies to share information. So in other words, put aside your short-term, uh, you know, profit-driven uh, considerations and think about the broader social good that you can do as companies and think about the value of your company if you're involved in, in even in a collaborative way, developing a vaccine that can actually treat and prevent coronavirus. Uh, we think that's a, that's a pretty important thing for a company to be doing, and we don't think that one company might necessarily have all the answers. So uh, we are asking uh, all these pharma companies that we engage with to work together and try and solve uh, this issue together. And so we, we have been uh, reasonably successful in getting safety practices put in place at all locations where all of this vaccine uh, work has, has been done. And we did get Merck and company and he and I, Lily, to commit to adopt what we call a needs-based approach for the distribution of COVID therapies. In other words, we will make sure that this uh, medicine is priced appropriately and is distributed to those who need it most. So the next slide. So Dustin talked about this one, Suncor. It's one of our longest standing engagements. And, and so some of our engagements are very tactical in nature. 
uh, where we're just trying to solve a specific ESG issue. And then some like the engagement with Suncor are very strategic in, na in, in nature. And so as Dustin said, we're really trying to help Suncor uh, you know, envision what a successful energy company looks like in a low carbon future. And you know that that when we first started out was probably a pretty strange conversation. But we kept we kept asking, uh, we kept collaborating, we came there, uh, you know, uh, in, on a best interest basis. In other words, we're interested in your company because we're invested in you. We want you to be successful. And over time, we built up this trust, and we ha and that's critical to a lot of these engagements is that the leaders of the companies you're engaging with trust your motives. And you know, our motives are pure in the sense that we we just want to make these better companies. And so we have this tremendous relationship uh, with Suncor right now. Uh, you know, our our uh, lead engagement uh, person, Jamie Bonham, is on a first name basis with the CEO of Suncor. Uh, he's probably on his speed dial. Uh, they meet regularly, uh, usually face to face, although uh, although not lately. And you know, what we're doing is getting Suncor to make commitments to what they're going to do to uh, both reduce their carbon emissions now and to change their operations to be successful in a low carbon environment. And the reason why Suncor is so important is because it is a leader in the oil and gas space in Canada. And so if we can get the leaders to make this shift, then we can get other companies to follow. And indeed, a company like Sonovas actually put out more aggressive targets than even Suncor did on the basis of the work that we're doing uh, with Suncor. Uh, next one. Uh, Dustin talked about diversity and inclusion. Uh, the, the RIA will be dedicating its traditional RI week in the last uh, week of October to diversity and inclusion. It's a great initiative. Uh, the RIA has also come out with a statement that uh, it's asking companies to sign. Of course, we signed it uh, uh, right away. I encourage you to go on the site and look for it and read it. And you can see a quote from that statement there uh, about you know, diversity and inclusion not only being the right thing to do, but it's really actually very good for business. And so in our voting decisions, we look at diversity and inclusion and, and we, we look at how companies are performing. And in some cases, and you can see examples here, we voted against the nominating committee uh, for lack of board gender diversity. We've come a long way on gender diversity, but there are still some out there and you can see three of them there that we voted against uh, this year. Uh, because of the lack of board diversity. Uh, there's also uh, the importance of racial diversity. This is a trickier one to get because uh, you don't always have the best data and we really encourage companies to collect and disclose their data on, on diversity, but we identified three companies there that we felt their leadership and their board really lacked racial diversity. And so we both voted against the nominating committee that was putting together the uh, slate of the board of directors. So that's, a, that's part of a corporate engagement program is to actually vote uh, your, your proxies uh, that we vote on your behalf as investors. We do that for every single holding across the entire NEI lineup. Uh, you know, it's, it's a massive amount each year, but it's a very powerful and effective way to get your voice heard in terms of the issues that are important to you. And then I think we got one more. So this is, this is some research that we did uh, coming out of COVID and coming out of the proxy voting season. And we looked at executive compensation and, you know, executive compensation is always, uh, you know, a challenge, but this year more than ever, uh, we saw that, you know, executive compensation is actually not just a company issue and it's not just about making a few people rich. What it is, is a significant driver of income inequality. And so we saw at the outset of COVID, a number of companies, 600 here on the Russell 2000 index in the US, uh, announcing voluntary pay cuts to their salaries. And, you know, it looked great. It made for great PR, yeah, uh, but here's the challenge. Most CEOs are not paid. <laughs> the, the, the bulk of their, their compensation does not come from salary. It comes from equity-based compensation. So it became a gesture that was far more symbolic than substantive. And so we, we drilled into this and, you know, really starting to understand, you know, how equity-based compensation is driving income inequality. Back in the 1990s, it was investors like us and other investors who were really behind uh, equity-based compensation because it was a way to incent executives to drive uh, the, the valuation and growth of a company. 
Uh, but now uh, it has become uh, with with companies growing at such astronomical rates in many cases, it has become a real problem in terms of excessive compensation. You know, compensation that is sometimes, you know, 300, 400, even 700 times that of the median income uh, for for a society, society or median income for employees in a company. And so what we're doing here is we're we're going to be going to companies and, and asking them, can you rethink your incentive plans? Can you think rethink your compensation structure and, and really try and do your part uh, to reduce income inequality? Uh, you know, move away from the symbolic gestures and actually create substantive change. And that's essentially what we do all the time with our engagement is we try and drive substantive change on behalf of investors like you uh, who really want to uh, feel that your purpose is being enabled and realized in the investments that you make. With that, I think we are going to turn it back over to Q&A. I've, I've closed it. Yep, are you considering so? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, David. That was fantastic, very informative uh, slide presentation as well, too. Um, a couple uh, items I'm reflecting on for me is that uh, I find it very interesting when the, uh, the CEO of the world's largest investment firm comments that uh, driving value for all stakeholders um, is something that is imperative and that NEI is persevering to drive this change and that responsible investment funds allow investors to invest responsibly and that in turn drives returns. So. Um, and that NEI drives change through deep, persistent dialogues with companies as well as shareholder proposals and proxy voting. So thank you so much for that uh, informative session. So, next up, we've got uh, Ryan Livingstone. Uh, Ryan Livingstone is a uh, certified financial planner with Libro Credit Union. He operates out of our Beachwood branch. Uh, Ryan's passionate about responsible investments and has earned his responsible investment specialist designation through the Responsible Investment Association. So I'm going to turn this over to Ryan now. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate it. Just bear with me one second. Get everything set up here. Okay. Perfect. So thank you, Dan. And thank you to our amazing speakers, Dustin and David, uh, for their great presentations. I'm sure there was a lot of information there that um, the average person watching would be able to take away for sure. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ryan Livingstone, financial advisor here at Libro. And I just want to spend a few minutes discussing how this all fits with Libro. Let's begin with Libro's philosophy. When it comes to investing, there are many different types of wealth philosophies that play a key role for investors. On this slide, it names just a few of them. On this slide right here, it breaks down the 20 year annualized returns for various different asset classes from 1999 till 20, to 2018. It breaks down some of the major asset classes by category. However, even with all things considered, as you can see from the graph, the average investor averaged a 1.9% rate of return annually over that 20 year period. The explanation for this is in large part to do with investor behavior. This is something that I personally speak to my owners about every meeting. This graph shows the average investor's rate of return versus the S&P TSX index from 1994 to 2015. As you can see, over time, we notice the gap continues to widen between the index and the average investor. This is what we call the behavior gap. Libro coaches build strong relationships with their owners and through consistent discussions, investment reviews, planning, and advice, our goal is to remove or reduce that gap as much as possible. Essentially, Libro's philosophy is behavioral coaching, sticking to the plan and stopping people from making the wrong decisions at the wrong time is very important for long-term investor success. The value of advice improves success over time. What independent studies have shown time and time again is that individuals that receive advice regarding their investments have up to 3.9 times more wealth than individuals 
or investors who do not receive advice or do not work with an advisor. As you can see from the graph, the longer an investor receives advice, the more wealth an individual has. To help with this, we start with financial planning. I want to provide a quote from the famous inventor Alexander Graham Bell that goes as follows. Before anything else, preparation is the key to success. As mentioned previously tonight, responsible investing can lead to better financial returns while contributing to positive social and environmental impact. It helps investors align their investments with their values. And as we can see, there is a huge demand for especially the younger generations of wanting to do that. Simply noted, responsible investing is good for returns. Historically, the tangible assets within an organization made up over 80% of the value of a company back as far as 1975. As you can see, it is now basically the polar opposite. In 2015, the breakdown of value with an organization is now about 16% tangible assets and 84% intangible. Some of the intangible assets within a company are as follows. Brand value, reputation, research and development pipeline, customer satisfaction, health and safety, environmental performance, social license to operate, and governance, just to name a few. You may have also heard of the term goodwill as it pertains to intangible assets. Socially responsible investing is becoming more and more popular, especially with the younger gen generations. Things are only expected to continue to go up from here. The data presented on this slide is based on 2018 information. However, from 2013 to 2018, average annual fund flows were 30 times greater than from 2009 to 2012. It really makes you wonder what we are to expect over the next five plus years. If you are wondering how you can get started in socially responsible investing, well, we are currently accepting meetings here at Libro in person, over the phone, or through virtual means. So whatever your situation or comfort level, we can help. We can also con you can also contact our contact center at 1-800-361-8222, or you can use our Find a Branch locator available on our website at libro.ca. And that's it for me, quick and, uh, quick and easy presentation. Thank you everyone for listening to our presentation. I will now pass it along to Dan uh, to discuss the Q&A. Thanks for that, Ryan. I appreciate uh, passing it over. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, a couple questions that have uh, popped up in our question chat that uh, we're trying to get to as much as we can. I know we're, uh, we've gone over our time uh, at this point here, rest assured if we don't get to your question, we will answer it. Um, and uh, if you can complete the survey at the end of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, if you'd like to be contacted, how Libro can best provide value to you as well too, we're happy to make a follow-up uh, as well. So uh, a couple questions. Uh, one that I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'd like to direct to um, uh, Dustin. Uh, the question was, how do you see exclusionary funds changing over time? I would be looking for screens of fossil fuels, but I like from time to time have an alcoholic beverage and even go to a casino. So wondering what that looks like from your space, how how do you see those funds uh, adapting over time, if any? Uh, well, thanks for the question. Um, that's, a, that's a tough call to make because those um, funds that say exclude certain industries, they're usually um, playing to um, uh, sort of the interests of, of maybe um, a group who wants to exclude certain industries, uh, often faith groups uh, are some of the, the leading investors in, in negative screened funds. Uh, hence the name Sin Stocks is a name you'll hear uh, referring to tobacco, weapons, alcohol. Um, I think I'm going to answer that question by 
by pointing to where I think the market's headed. And I would say this totally independently if, if David and NEI were not represented here. I think the market's heading towards stewardship. Um, and so based on the recognition that you can exclude companies if you want, uh, you can exclude, um, you can get funds that exclude oil companies if you want, um, but what's the impact that you're making in that case? Are your dollars having a positive impact? Are they contributing to uh, improving the environmental track record of, of that industry? If you're in a fund that excludes fossil fuels, the answer is actually no. Um, but if you're in a fund that is engaging with the oil and gas companies to encourage them to, to uh, produce energy in a responsible, sustainable way, to be engaging with their stakeholders, indigenous communities, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing, uh, reducing methane leakage, um, that's a measurable positive impact. So I think I would say those products will always be available for the investor who wants that strategy. But I think there's going to be uh, probably more growth on the stewardship side, on the engagement side. Um, that, that's how I think I, I would position that. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, stewardship, and definitely the impact it can have as well, too. Thank you so much for that, Dustin. Uh, another question I'm going to uh, direct uh, to David, um, if you can comment on this as well. Uh, how do socially responsible investment funds manage their portfolios? Do they have a team to help them stay on top of their holdings? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. Uh, you know, we at NEI, we, um, we have relationships with uh, what we call some advisors. So those are organizations that manage our funds uh, for us. Many of these organizations are leading uh, responsible investment or ESG focused organizations. And so uh, many of them do have uh, teams that, that specialize in doing uh, environmental, social and governance analysis that fully integrate environmental considerations into their investment decisions. And, and, and as a result, you know, both evaluate companies from a traditional financial lens, as well as the lens of uh, environmental, social and governance factors. And we think that that is a uh, a greater execution of fiduciary duty, as, as Dustin mentioned, in terms of making an investment decision. There is a great wide world out there of factors, and we, you saw the chart, that have a tremendous influence on the value of a company. And if you're not looking at those factors, if you're not looking at those ESG factors, then you're essentially driving down the road with one hand over your eye, or maybe one hand over one and a half eyes, uh, so you're not really getting the full picture. And so the the managers that we work with are, are specialists in this space and have teams that are dedicated to do that. In addition, for, for NEI, our ESG team, the team that I manage, also weighs in on doing evaluations sometimes uh, in partnership with these uh, investment managers. Uh, so we make sure that we concur on what we believe are the ESG risks faced by certain companies and whether we think they're addressing those risks. And then as we've talked about lots tonight, we also actively engage uh, with select companies across the NEI lineup to help management understand uh, what risks are in front of them, how they can be uh, greater and um, uh, sustainability leaders and how they can be better companies for our investors. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. Uh, that actually uh, really combines well with another question that was uh, set in as well too. Um, how do SRI funds manage their portfolios? Do they have a team helping them? Uh, as well as how does one assess the responsible investment processes in place at asset managers? Is there only one way of getting it done? Um, I think that resonates as well too with the, uh, the comment you made about uh, the traditional financial lens, how it's looked at, as well as uh, including the environmental, social, and governance aspects uh, to that as well, too. And uh, I'm going to uh, go at this one because it uh, it is definitely looming, and it's uh, one of those questions that um, would uh, really is at the top of everybody's mind, particularly here in Canada now. Uh, do you think the U.S. election will have consequences? on the market. And uh, Dave, are you able to uh, comment on that for us as well too, briefly? 
Uh, I can comment on that. Um, I think after the 2016 election, I can't do worse as a prognit <laughs> and, a, and a prognication as uh, as happened then. Uh, I'll talk about it through, first of all, through the responsible investment lens. Responsible investment, as we saw in the charts tonight, has been growing steadily. And it did not suddenly turn south when the Trump government got elected and started to dismantle a lot of regulations. Uh, what happened was investors and companies uh, ended up, uh, you know, still working together, still talking the same language, and we see tremendous advancements in responsible investing uh, in the four years that Mr. Trump has been president. Uh, will will the markets, uh, you know, change uh, with the election of the president? They always do. Uh, will the markets appreciate, I think, uh, a sense of stability in Washington? Should Mr. Biden win? I think they would. Markets generally like uh, consistency and predictability, and we've had none of that right now. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that there's going to be a massive market uptick or a massive market downturn on, on uh, uh, as a result of, of this election, but I think that uh, all of us who are investors can feel, I think, a little more certain about the world that we're in when we have an administration in the White House that's actually considering, uh, you know, global issues. You know, Joe Biden has said he will sign the Paris Accord, re-sign the Paris Accord the first day of his administration. I think that's great from a uh, responsible investment angle, but it's great for people too who are concerned about climate change. So I just see that this is a train that is uh, has left the station and is rolling on with tremendous momentum. And I, I don't see the uh, uh, the election in the White House having longer term implications. There might be some short term blips, but longer term, I think we've seen the trend line. Dustin, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I would just agree and, and echoing what David said. I mean, this market was was growing before um, you know Trump came along and it's continued to grow despite Trump, government's not played a role at all in this market. It's being driven by market demand. Um, and so uh, I think the, the prospects for responsible investment um, are, are largely independent of what happens this election in the US. Wonderful. Thank you both for your comments on that uh, and everybody who has actually uh, entered questions. Uh, we have gone a little over our time for this evening. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody who has uh, come out, who has attended this webinar. I hope we've uh, been able to provide some value. Uh, in the chat, there has been a survey link there as well too. We, please, please, please fill it in. We didn't get your question. We will definitely respond to it. Um, We'd love the opportunity to introduce you, set you up with a coach to make sure we can uh, provide some value to you as a follow up on this end as well. So thank you all for attending. A special thanks uh, to Dustin and David. Appreciate your time coming out and uh, uh, addressing some uh, issues and providing some well thought out uh, presentations for us. It's been uh, greatly appreciated from everybody here at Libro and all of the owners we serve. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. And thank you all for attending this webinar. We'll be uh, shutting it down. Um, thanks for your time this evening. Uh, have a safe and wonderful evening. Thank you so much.